That's right. Bible smack. All right, hello and welcome. We are in class two of New Year's Cosmology. As I said, class number two. And today's subtitle will be Why Matter Matters. Ah! All right, I'm going to start us off with a verse here. Hebrews 11, verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So I explained epistemologically my worldview in class one and the worldview presuppositions uh, as you go about studying the idea of cosmology. Now, anytime it says logic, it's like logic or understanding, so biology, that's study of life, okay? So, or geology, study of earth. So, cosmos is translated world or earth, okay? And uh, that's C-O-S-M-O-S, -O -S, for all you want to keep records of this if you don't see these very well. But uh, basically, uh, uh, it could be Earth or it could be world. And then when we think about the universe, that's also our world. Okay. Now, I remember uh, a place uh, not too far off away from where I'm, Cosmosdale, which was a place where they had a factory for making cement. And basically, it was like Cosmos Dale. So that's where you get that Earth world type of thing. And so we talk about worldviews and philosophy. This is ultimately what we're talking about. We want to know what our world is, what our Earth is, what all this stuff, you know, what is reality. Okay. Now, when we start talking, you got to go to philosophy first. Okay. Philosophy. I should say philosophy, and I got philos first. If y'all ever watched a movie in recent years called uh, God's Not Dead, they uh, quote Stephen Hawking, and he says, he's a cosmologist, and he says, philosophy is dead. Now, I didn't check the quote, but uh, if that's true, that's pretty stupid of him. Because really, cosmology has to start with philosophy. Why? Because when we're doing the scientific method, you start off your first starting point is hypothesis. Now, I call this, on the internet and other things, I call it the New Year's Cosmology Hypothesis. So I'm giving you a starting point for science, or at least for this cosmology, I should say. Okay, it's not all science starts at this point, but it's an uh, educated guess or an idea that will bring us into our scientific studies. Because all science can do is they take the hypothesis and they analyze it and they test it and either it's right or it's wrong. But even if it's right, it's not really true. It's just not disproved yet. Okay, so you're coming up with an idea. Who knows where we get it? And then maybe the idea might be right, maybe it might be wrong. And then what about the people who are less than honest? I read uh, somewhere it said that 2% of scientists admit that they're dishonest when it comes to presenting the facts. That's, that's problematic because that's not including all the ones who lie about it and just lie. <laughs> that's the one who say, I'm going to be honest and tell you I'm lying. <laughs> so basically... It's hard to obtain truth just by the scientific method. Scientific method is only taking somebody's guess and testing it. Okay, as far as scientific, the scientific method goes. So today is why matter matters. What is matter? It is the material world. We think about it in the forms of uh, solids, liquids, gases, and another one plasma. Okay? Now, matter is all these things, but how do we know what matter is? Well, you have to understand what nature is. But 
where do we go with nature? So you have to get to this point of scaling, and scaling is a measurement. And is there an infinite or is there a limit? Now, in philosophy and theology, we put this on the issue of theism, and theism is God, but what is our view? Is it monotheism, the traditional view of one creator God, or is it pantheism, the view that eternity lies in the material world? Or atheism, that there is no infinite, that everything is limited to the material, and that's all we have is the material. Now, if everything is limited to the material, then we have to know, is material, um, get to a point, does it get to a point where that is all that is? Or is there anything past material? And that's where we have to go to history and the history of philosophy. Now there is a group before Socrates among the Greeks that were trying to figure out reality. And they were trying to do so rationally. Now there had been people before and these people would go to what we call mythology they would see something and make up a story about how that came to be. So you go through the woods and you feel the wind. And you say, that's the wind god. You would see animals moving about and you say, there's the spirits of the animals. There's the sun, the sun god. And basically you would have this description of forces but you would never really hold it to any logical accountability. That's the essence of mythology. The heathens, the Greeks, in other words, they're unreligious, decided that mythology doesn't really cut it as far as knowing the truth. It's just tales that people tell, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not. It might be useful in certain circumstances. They, maybe there's always a good story to make people think about something. You know, like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, or Hansel and Gretel, and all these other fairy tales. Okay? But, it's not really getting any concrete truth. It's not even getting the moral truth. So, uh, the pre-Socratic philosophers came about during this time, and they wanted to get rid of all the superstition and they wanted to deal with just strict logic. And so before the era of Socrates, they really battled about these ideas. And one guy that kind of dealt with this stuff is a guy named Democritus. And Democritus uh, started to develop these ideas that everything was of one substance or one material. Now, other philosophers would deal with this on different levels, and some people would say, no, 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 there's two substances, or four substances. And, uh, you know, they would go with various elements and stuff like that, and eventually you find yourself all the way down to the 1800s. In the 1800s, you had chemistry come up with the table of elements, okay? And you go through all these, the periodic table, and you go through all these different elements. And they would all break down to atoms. And each different atom or element represented a substance. And so this is what the whole universe was made of, these different elements in the periodic table. But really, that's just a very complicated way of going all the way back to Democritus, talking about everything boils down to this one substance. Okay, and they would have something they would say that uh, I eat potatoes is what they would say. And when I eat potatoes, then my fingernails start to grow. So since my fingernails are growing 
and I'm eating the potatoes, then my fingernails are made of potatoes. Because they would say that everything is made of the same substance. What was the one substance? The one substance for Democritus was the atom. The atom was the thing that everything broke down to, and it was the smallest form of matter. Okay? Now, his ideas would develop into the modern era, and you might hear the word materialism, or there's another word that they use a little bit later, and many thinkers would say it's the same. Some might say it's different because they came about it at different points and different angles, but really it's about the same. Physicalism, okay? Everything's physical, everything's material. Um, materialism would battle the idea, I talked about it in the last class, that the mental world is not material. They would argue with that. They would say that everything that you have in your mind is a chemical reaction. And so there is no such thing as free will. But if there's no such thing as free will, we would not have ideas that are not in the material world. In fact, think about it like this. If something is fiction, then you say it's not real. But if it's not real, then there is something which is not a material thing. So just by the fact that you're wrong makes materialism flawed at least when we start talking about the mind and the material world. But is this just something, you know, goofy on the inside? Uh, ultimately, everything's going to go back to Democritus, okay? When he fails, and he did, then the whole materialistic worldview, which is what we undergird with atheism, because there is no supernatural, so if there is no supernatural... All we have is the natural world, and there is no God. And when we try to attempt a material world, when it fails, then we have to move on. But in history, it failed, they moved on, and then they tried it again. See, the key error with this is a fallacy of inductive logic. And the fallacy of inductive logic is the simple fact that when they make the argument, all things are material, or two materials, or 93 materials, all that kind of stuff. See, all these materials is a guess. Have you been all over the universe? Have you walked everywhere? Have you taken a stroll to Uranus? Have you gone to uh, a nebula? No, of course not. These are things that you can only ascertain so much information about. We haven't even been to the center of our Earth. So how do we know? See, at this point, science fails because science is supposed to be about observation. Later on, they use mathematical calculations to make up for observations. But you're still lost because there are things that you don't know. Um, let's say if I took you and you're not a Navy SEAL or Green Beret, and I dropped you in the middle of the woods that you've never been to before at about 4 or 5 a.m. at night, where are you going to go? The majority of people wouldn't go anywhere. Why? Because they do not know where they're going. So if they go somewhere, they may be wasting their time in the wrong direction. They may fall into a trap. Maybe there's a giant cobra, quicksand, volcano, flushing monster, you know, robot dog, you know, whatever. <laughs> Basically, you don't know. There's that mystery, and that mystery stops. At least it stops when it comes to the idea of certainty. And so the Greeks 
would end up getting hit by this idea of certainty and it would stop them. And there is a famous tale um, we talk about with uh, Aesop's fables, the tortoise and the hare. And uh, what they did was they had, uh, let's see here, the tortoise and Achilles. Achilles was this super soldier from um, that one famous Trojan story. Ooh, you see, you're studying other things and you get kind of mixed up. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I'll probably... Iliad. The Iliad. Aha. So anyhow, um, basically the tortoise, whenever Achilles was about to beat him, the tortoise was given a little bit more room. And then every time Achilles came up to him, the tortoise would keep on going. And they'd never get to the end because Achilles would just be a percentage just behind him. And so that's what goes on with the fallacy of inductive logic. And that's pretty much why the ancient Greeks were so mathematically gifted that they could show you the distance from the earth to the sun and yet they never flew a plane. Okay, They, they had a stopping point. This is where a lot of people got stuck on flat earth issues and stuff like that because they thought at a certain point we're going to fall off the earth because they did not have intellectual ability to justify going any farther. So we end up there, we end up with our epistemological problems and the question is, is this universe just material? I mean, I just argue that we can't know, but is this universe break down in the material? Now, with Democritus and his idea of the atom, the atom, it didn't really matter exactly what size the atom was. The atom could be much smaller than a proton particle, or the atom could be as big as the Astrodome. You see, the big deal of the atom for Democritus was that it was indivisible. And when we got down to the periodic table of the 1800s chemist, what we would find is that matter would break down to elements and they would not be divisible. But when you got to the atoms that made these elements, which would be maybe even farther than Democritus would go, but when you actually broke it down to the elemental atoms. Once you got past those, you broke the rule for materialism. Because materialism has to be that there's one substance that's indivisible. But the atom in nuclear physics is divisible. And that is the problem. Because now all of a sudden we go past that and then we would go into the issue of particles, okay? Now, there's an experiment which is very important to the scientific world. It's been redone millions of times just because it's so freaky, to be honest with you. And that is called the double slit experiment. Now, what they would do is they would have this gun, and here's my stupid little electron gun, and fire an electron, and then you'd see this wall right here with two slits. And whenever the particles would go through it, uh, what happened was they shot the particles and then they found that these particles formed waves. And so basically, instead of a particle, you'd have a wave going through the double slit. Then, when they took the camera, and there's my little funny camera right there, they took a picture, what was supposed to be a wave turned into an electron. The electrons, not only was it the fact that the electron switched with a wave, it was the fact that observing this electron 
turned it back into an electron instead of a wave. There is a video that it's not, uh, they would not be monotheists, they would be pantheists, but there is a video of cosmologists who really do a good job on this issue. And you can look it up, it's called The Holographic Universe, you can check that out on YouTube. As I said, they're not leading you to Christianity or God or anything close. Just dealing with the materialistic worldview. And what they end up seeing is that matter is, for them, an illusion. And one thing that's interesting is um, in their video course, they have a physicist talking about helping us understand the amount of space that's within the atom. If I had an atom in my hand, this was like a nucleus of an atom. It's the size of a basketball. If I had that nucleus there at scale, the electron for that atom should be 20 miles away. And what's in between the electron and the nucleus? Empty space. Now hold on. That double slit, slit experiment said that the electron transformed itself into energy. But that electron is what holds the unit of matter together. So that unit of matter can be broken down into energy. The material that makes up the neutron and the proton and electron, call it quarks, that breaks down, I think there are about six substances, but then that breaks down to vibrations. I don't know if it's sound, I don't want to say that. As I said, I'm coming from a theological, philosophical background. I deal with the scientific material from a logical standpoint, but I'm not, you know, a scientist myself. So I don't want to venture too far out here, but basically, all these things go into vibrations. Now here's another problem though. If the material world breaks down to energy, what is energy without the material world? <coughs> Think about this. How do we know what energy is? You see there's energy coming down that way in the form of light. But what if there was nothing for the light to shine on? You say, oh, I feel something warm coming on my skin. That must be energy. But what happens if there's no matter to be heated? If there's nothing for the energy to heat up, then how do we know it's there? You say, oh, well, there's force. How do you know that there's force if there's no force to go against? There's no way of measuring. Is energy anything if there's no matter to measure it by? Because it's no longer a thing. Now, the holographic universe would eventually say that all matter is a holographic projection. And so they would say that the whole world is an illusion. But... The argument that a theist would argue with an atheist about is over intelligent design. The idea that there is an order to things. Well, doesn't there have to be an order to make an illusion, almost maybe even a better order? Because there is an intent behind an illusion. You know, Einstein uh, was very much a naturalist, but you see... Einstein did eventually have to believe in a form of God. He said he believed in the God of the philosopher Spinoza. And I think Spinoza had something to do with psychology, but let's not go too far there. But basically, he believed in a form of God because there has to be. You see, in order for me to observe something, there has to be something that is able to be observed. Just like that camera there making that able to be observed by being an electron. So, essentially, what happens is that there is a course, there is an intelligence.
Now, holographic guys would say, okay, there's just this haze of infinite, and then it'll adjust to us. Why would it adjust to us? Why are there any rules? You know, why is there science to begin with? The word science comes from knowledge. Who has the knowledge? Who knows these things? Who is making the laws of knowledge, the laws of science, the laws of nature? It either gets goofy with I am making my own world type of positive new age nonsense. Or you go to atheism, which says, no, there's no knowledge. And if there's no knowledge, then why should you have any? You know, if you've descended from a rock, then your knowledge comes from a rock. Your knowledge is not knowledge at all. See, you cannot define nature. And another flip side of atheism would be naturalism. If you can't define what is natural, then how can you deny what is supernatural? You have to have a definition of nature and then say, uh, if you go past that, that's not natural. So that would prove supernaturalism if you prove it. Naturalism is a philosophy that developed in the 1700s. You know, if we talk to them about all the innovations of electromagnetic energy, they would assume that that was sorcery and could not be true. And they would have a point because a lot of the occult sciences dealt with fields of electromagnetism. And they would do a lot of their aerodynamics and the way they would make their temples and things like that would have to do with electromagnetic fields and the electromagnetic field of the earth. And so it would count. But you see, we already surpassed that point. It's already dead. So as we develop these ideas, we have to understand that there's nothing to prove our world by itself. There has to be an infinite. But where does that infinite go? Now, another issue, before I forget it, is Plato would come up with a dualism. He would say there is a material world, but there's also an immaterial world. And we know the immaterial world in the world of ideas. When you see a dog, the dog eats, the dog poops. It breathes, it sleeps. The atoms that are in that dog are not the same atoms that would be in the dog by the end of its life. So is it the same dog? Or how do we know that it is a dog? Wasn't it dog food earlier? We have an idea of what a dog is. And if that matter doesn't approve, then we don't think of that as a dog. There is an idea. There is an ideal world behind the physical world. And so that again goes with it. And that's why the Greeks, they failed under Democritus to prove a material world. So then they had to go towards a spiritual realm. And that wasn't instantly Christianity, but these are the things that are getting ready as they started to realize that monotheism made more sense, then they would have to find some sort of connection with God, which they found with the Jews. And then when they found the revelations of Christianity, that's when they would consider things and move over as society. Let's see here. Now, uh, I guess uh, next episode we're going to deal with uh, the secular model, the Big Bang Theory. And I'm going to show, step by step, why it is dead. Um, I guess two ideas I can go ahead and throw at you right now is the idea of the Big Bang coming out of nothing. How do you know? And I'll get all my other ideas about this a little later, okay? But... The question I have to throw at you. How do you know that the Big Bang was a Big Bang into nothing? It would really be nothing that you know. 
But if we have a thing, then it's going to make that bang harder. The ancient Greeks would think of the space of the universe, and they would call it ether. You might hear in poetic literature, the ethereal realm, okay? And that, that was their identification of outer space. But um, outside of that space, with the cosmos, they would have what they called the plenum. And the plenum was ultimate, everything. It was the opposite of a vacuum. It was the maximum. And in many ways, it was an identification of God. God being infinite. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out. We're going to, um, I will have to discuss at some point the, um, the arguments of Aristotle and Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, as far as like uh, the proofs of God. I will say, I don't believe that they prove Jehovah my God. But I do believe that they push the negative of the atheistic assumption. And the atheistic assumption um, would have to be about these different five arguments. But I'll go ahead and we'll discuss that on our next class of New Year's Cosmology.